U.S. Navy history arriving. Welcome back to the U.S. Navy History Podcast. I am Dale, and over there, the XO, Steve. Hi, Steve. Hey, everyone. So, Steve, I know how it affected you last time when we lost the peacock. I still have not recovered emotionally. So I figured this week I would tell you about all four USS Peacocks. The legacy continued? There are four ships that bear the name USS Peacock. Oh, this brightens my day so much. You ready to get underway? Let's cast off. All right, so the first one is the USS Peacock. This is the 1813 version. This is the one that started out as an HMS and then we uh, liberated from British control, right? No. Am I misremembering how this thing started? Well, why don't you let me tell you about her? Okay. Some fan of the peacock you are. (laughs) So, well, let's go over her uh, statistics real quick. She was ordered March 3rd, 1813. She was built in Adam and Noah Brown, New York Navy Yard. Her keel was laid down July 9th, 1813, and she was launched September 19th, 1813, and then was decommissioned in October in 1827. She had a refit, so she was converted to an exploring ship in 1828 and was recommissioned in 1829. She was a sloop of war. She was at 509 tons burthen. She had a length of 119 feet, a beam of 31 feet 6 inches, a draft of 16 feet 4 inches, and her propulsion was sail. Her crew complement was 140 officers and enlisted, and she was armed with 20 32-pound carronades, two 12-pound bow chasers. So... During the War of 1812, she made three cruises under the command of Master Commandant Lewis Warrington. She departed New York on March 12, 1814, and she sailed with supplies to the Naval Station at St. Mary's, Georgia, off of Cape Canaveral, Florida. She captured the brig HMS Epiver and sent her to Savannah, Georgia, and the Navy took the Epiver into service and, of course, just kept her name. She then departed Savannah on June 4th on her second cruise, going to the Grand Banks, which is along the coast of Ireland and Spain. Then she came back via the West Indies to New York, capturing 14 enemy vessels of different sizes. On August 14th, the Peacock captured the William and scuttled her. She then departs New York on January 23rd of 1815 with the Hornet and the Tom Bowline and rounded the Cape of Good Hope into the Indian Ocean, where she captures the Union, Venus, and Brio del Mar on the 13th, 21st, and 29th of June, respectively. She then burns the Union and Brio del Mar and puts their crews on the Venus, which she then sent it to... Batvia. So, because these captures occurred after the end of the war, the Phoenix and Star Insurance Companies of Calcutta went to the U.S. government for compensation. Congress decided to give them the compensation and gave them £12,000 for the Union and 3000 for the Brio del Mar. On June 30th, she captures the 16-gun brig Nautilus which was commanded by Lieutenant Charles Boyce of the Bombay Marine of the British East India Trading Company in the Straits of Sudan, Indonesia. In this mm, final naval battle of the war, Boyce informs Warrington that the war had ended. Now, Warrington didn't believe him. He thought he was making a ruse and ordered Boyce to surrender. And, of course, Boyce refuses. So, Warrington opens fire, killing a seaman, two European invalids, and three Lescars, and wounding Boyce severely. And mortally wounding his first lieutenant, wounding five other Lescars, 
And then the casualties over on the American side were four, maybe five wounded. Now, Boyce then provides documents proving that the Treaty of Ghent had been signed, ending the war. And Warrington releases them. Though it is pointed out that he never did inquire about Boyce's condition or anybody that he had injured on the Nautilus. Peacock then returns to New York on October 30th, and a court of inquiry in Boston about a year later exonerates Warrington of all blame. So, in other words, give the paperwork before you start fighting. I think that's what we learned there. (laughs) Uh, What we learned is Messenger Seagull would have been very handy to... uh get the ceasefire and peace treaty over to the captain of the peacock because that guy was less of a peacock and more of a warhawk or when saying hey the war is over i have proof show them the you know say i have proof and show them the proof (laughs) instead of saying hey the war is over well then surrender no he could also just said okay i surrender everything would have ended peacefully then they could have shown them the paperwork and have been like okay Everybody goes on the merry way. Nobody has to die. I mean, well, surrendering without firing a shot would be a huge, huge, you know, not only insult to that captain's honor, but I imagine that's a court marshable offense. Couldn't they just have, like, each taken a boat out and like, hey, here's the copy. I don't know why you haven't gotten yours yet. We good? We good. Okay. All they had to do was give them the proof. And besides, it's just an English captain. Who cares if they're dishonored by surrendering? <laughs> the, that captain? The uh, inevitable court-martial? We love the court-martials. Uh, we love the court-martials, but I'm sure those officers do not. So? <laughs> but I, I do think I am realizing why I got mixed up thinking that the Peacock was initially a U.S. capture of a British vessel. Um, Holy crap, did she capture a lot? She did. She surely was very successful. So, after the war, she leaves New York on June 13th of 1816, on course for France, with the Honorable Albert Gallatin on the party, aboard the boat. She pulls into Havre de Grace on July 2nd, and then joins the Mediterranean Squadron. She stays with the squadron until 1821 and then comes home so she stays out there for quite a long time yeah and then goes into the navy yard on july 10th so is that from being on patrol for that half decade nothing really to report no nothing really to report that we haven't already reported on right so in the 1820s pirates were active in the west indies yep So the Peacock becomes the flagship for Commodore David Porter in 1822. And, you know, he takes charge of rooting out those dastardly pirates. She serves in the expedition with the U.S. Revenue Marine schooner Louisiana, the British schooner HMS Speedwell, and they break up a pirate establishment at Bahia Honda Key. They capture four vessels. They burn two and they put prize crews aboard the other two and send them to New Orleans. And 18 of the crew members that were captured were sent to New Orleans for trial. Then the Peacock captures the scooter pilot on April 10th in 1823 and another sloop on the 16th. Then in September of 1822, they get yellow fever. At least that's what they think. So the peacock goes back to Norfolk, Virginia, because if everybody's dying of yellow fever, you can't really fight. They couldn't have pulled into a closer port? They could have, but I'm sure they wanted to go home. And no other port would have accepted them. At least if you go to New York, they're over there. They had a hospital on an island where they would quarantine sick people. Ah, uh, okay. So they would get treatment at least. If you go into a foreign port, there's no telling whether you're going to get treatment or not. You're just going to get quarantined. Yeah. 
but there was a naval hospital in New York on an island where it, it they isn't would like today where the United States Navy has a presence in almost every major U.S. affiliated port. No. Yeah, we have multiple bases around the world in friendly countries that have allowed mm -hmm. us to put them there. At this time, there was none of that. Yeah. So the next year in 1823, around July, the Peacock was involved in the Battle of Lake Maracabio. And then in 1824, the Peacock goes into the Pacific for a number of months and cruises along the west coast of South America. And this is prior to the big expedition that we covered last episode. Yes, it would be. In September of 25, the Peacock was commanded by Commodore Thomas Casby Jones, and they went to Hawaii. Woo! Where, where he negotiated a treaty of friendship, commerce, and navigation. And from... July of 26 till January of 27, they go and visit other Pacific islands to protect American commerce and the whaling industry. Returning to South America from Hawaii, they were struck by a whale, suffering serious damage. You remember that? Yep. But she reaches Calio and then departs in June for New York. She gets to New York in... 27 to be decommissioned. She was broken up and rebuilt in 28 for the planned expedition of exploration. We covered this. She stayed the same size and configuration, but her guns were reduced to eight long 24 pound guns and two long nine pound guns. And of course, you know, that voyage got stalled by Congress over and over and over and over. So she got thrown back into regular service. Yeah. Went to the West Indies. M money, money is needed for expeditions like that. Yeah. So she went to the West Indies from 29 to 31. She was then refitted and then she and the newly commissioned boxer were ordered to assist the frigate Potomac, which had just sailed on the first Sumatran expedition. They were also charged with diplomatic missions and Boxer left Boston Harbor in the middle of February of 32 with orders to go to Liberia and then join the Peacock off of Brazil. So Peacock gets underway March 8th, 32 under commander David Gessinger. So the Peacock conveys Mr. Francis Baylies and his family to the United Provinces of the River Plate which is in Argentina, where he was to assume the post of the charge de affairs for the United States in the wake of the Lexington raid on the Falkland Islands in 31. When she got there, British ships of the line, the Plantagenet and the Druid complimented her flag by playing Hail Columbia. They liked her flag. Um, okay. So they leave orders for Boxer to follow them to Ben Colon on June 25th of 32. And she departs for the Cape of Good Hope. She takes on water at Tristan D. Conha and rounds the Cape. So they describe this as being struck by a sea of uncommon height and volume. Well, now we would just call that a rogue wave. Oh, so that wasn't just rough chop up in, uh, well, down in the Cape of Good Hope? No, it, it would be a rogue wave. It's just a wave that just comes out of nowhere. Yep. And hits you. And it nearly threw her on her beam end. It completely overwhelmed the gig in her starboard quarter and rushed it. It also buried the first three rat lines off the mizzen shrouds and threw them into the water. That's a lot of ship terms. Translating to common English, it sounds like a lot of the ship was uh, submerged by the wave at one point. 
Is that the short and sweet? Yeah, the short and sweet is she was almost capsized and she was partially sinking for a while. Which, it being a rogue wave, I'm, I'm surprised she wasn't capsized. So she then proceeds to Ben Coolin, where she receives words that the Potomac had completed the mission. She then had orders to gather information before going to Chochin, China. So she goes to Manila by way of Long Island and Kakarota, where hot springs found on the eastern side of the islands, 150 feet from the shore, were boiling. In other words, they found a probably found a volcanic vent. Hmm. So she then tried to go through the Sundra Strait, but her chronometers stopped working, and she had to do it by dead reckoning, which is going to make that a whole lot harder. So, chronometer, obviously a timekeeping piece. Mm-hmm. Um, so, was it standard for naval ships to have a, a timekeeping piece that wasn't just relying on someone keeping an eye on the hourglass and ringing a bell? Oh, yeah. At this time, uh, chronometers were standard issue for navigation. Okay. So what's the difference between a chronometer and uh, just a run-of-the-mill clock, I suppose? Well, a marine chronometer is a precision timepiece. It is used to determine the ship's position by celestial navigation. It is used to determine longitude by comparing Greenwich Mean Time and the time at the current location found from observing the stars. This allowed them to have accurate knowledge of where they were at a given time. Okay. So, yeah, that, that does sound like it's pretty important, not just a clock then. Not just a clock, right. Or they would have just said, clock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these things haven't come up yet, so I, that's why I was like, well, if it's a clock, I mean, you can roughly look up and guess it's noon if the sun's at its highest point. Yeah. Adjust from there. Well, if you don't know where the longitude is. Yeah, no, if, yeah, Pacific or Atlantic Ocean, if you don't know what your longitude is, Yes, sail east or west, eventually you will hit something, but it, it's good to know where you're at. Oh, yes. So from there, the crew gets pretty sick. They get dysentery, cholera. Did we graduate from yellow fever to green fever? Are we going up the rainbow? Well, it was coming out the back end, I'll last, I know that for sure. They lose seven of their crew to the diseases that hit the ship. So after everything was sanitized and everybody got better, they take on a pilot who charged them $13 and a bottle of rum. For what service? I mean, I know what a pilot does. Mm -hmm. why, why do they need this guy? To get them into harbor safety, safely. Oh, okay. So they hang around for six weeks around Canton City, China. And then winter starts coming in, which means monsoon season. And, of course, they still haven't run into the boxer. They say, well, we're out. And go to Linton Island in the Pearl River estuary for the Bay of Turan. Because that was the best access for... Hugh, her mission was to explore the possibilities of expanding trade with the kingdom. The kingdom being uh, the Chinese monarchy at this point, right? I think it was under China, but this is modern day Vietnam. Oh, okay. So February 8th, they get underway for the Gulf of Siam where she anchors about 15 miles from the mouth of the river Menom, over there near Thailand. In March of 33, Roberts finishes the Siamese-American Treaty 
of Commerce with the minister representing King Rama III and leaves on April 5th to go to Singapore, where she stays for about half a month. So she's in the Red Sea in August, and she finds the Nautilus. Hey, Nautilus. Oh, that certainly took her long enough. Yeah, this is the same brig that she attacked at the end of the war of 1812. <laughs> How you doing? Yeah, so the Peacock was on their way to Mocha, and the Nautilus was on their way to Surat. This time, the Peacock did not attack them. Did the Nautilus surrender this time? No. No surrendering, no attack. I'm very confused by this. Well, just because you see a former enemy does not mean you have to attack them, especially when there's no ongoing conflict. Does not compute. Well, it is what it is. Like, I'm, I'm expecting an honor duel or something between the captains. The guy got injured. A lot of guys got injured, especially on the Nautilus. Yeah, yeah, not just the captain. Yeah. So they get to Muscat in September, and they do a treaty with the Sultan said Bin Sultan, and leaves October 7th. They then go to Rio de Janeiro on January 17th of 34, where Roberts disembarks and goes on board the Lexington to go back to Boston. So C.K. Stringbling, Stringbling, <laughs> so C.K. Stribbling takes command and they go with the Enterprise for New York Harbor. Well, it took a few years, but this sounds like a circumnavigation. They did a lot of diplomatic missions between 31 and 34. I don't believe it was entirely circumnavigation, though. So, Roberts, he takes the peacock back again. He loves the peacock, just like you do. <laughs> this time, he and the Enterprise go to Brazil. They go around the Cape of Good Hope to Zanzibar because Roberts was due to ramifications of a couple of treaties. Okay. So that brings us to the Mesera incident. Well, that sounds forbidding. Yeah, this is when she grounds on a coral reef about 400 miles from Muscat, which is just southeast of Mazara Island. And this was September of 35. So the crew throws overboard 11 of their 22 guns to refloat the ship. So, do we know how they ran aground of the reef? Like, was it just not charted and they hit it because they didn't realize it was there? Was there a squall that, you know, was pushing them and uh, they were trying to avoid it but just couldn't? He blames it on the current. We have a statement from him of what happened that we'll get to here in just a minute. So, after throwing overboard half their guns to refloat the ship. They repel Arab marauders and then set sail. Uh, Sinban Sultan, he later recovers those guns and he returned them to Roberts free of charge. What? Yeah, he gave them back. Hey, this is just even more confusing. <laughs> what on earth? I, I'm just... <laughs> Shock one, these are heavy cannons. It's not like that's easy to retrieve after it's been dumped overboard. Two, the fact that he returns them, I'm taking means they still worked. I feel like salt water should be a little, you know, corrosive to metal. Well, it'd be, it depends on how long they were laying down on the bottom for. I suppose. And I mean, again, they're just tubes of metal. With two openings, one for the cannonball, one to put a lit match. Yep. Fair enough. The, like, the, this is, for lack of a better term, it's a cast iron barrel. Yeah. I, I guess I'm so used to my firearms having a lot more moving parts. Oh, they definitely do nowadays. Back then, there was one. 
and that was the wheels. So here's the statement, and this statement is actually from S.B. Haynes to John Weems, but it's about this incident. He says, I certify that during the period I have navigated the Arabian coast, had been employed in the trigonometrical survey of the same, now executing by the order of the Bombay government, that I have ever found it necessary to be careful to take nocturnal as well as diurnal observations as frequent as possible, owing to the rapidly and fickleness of the currents, which in some parts I have found running at the rate of three and four knots an hour, and I have known the Polarius set between 40 and 50 miles dead in shore, in a dead calm during the night. It is owing to such currents that I conceive the United States ship of war, Peacock, ran aground, as have many British ships in previous years, on and near the same spot, when at the changes of the monsoons and sometimes at the full and change, you have such thick weather as to prevent the necessary observations, being taken with accuracy and the navigator standing on with confidence as his position, and with no land in sight, finds himself to his sorrow often wrong, owing to a deceitful and imperceptible current, which has set him with rapidly upon it. The position of Mazara Island is laid down by Owen many miles too much to the westward. So this is him coming to Robert's aid, saying, he didn't screw up, it was the currents. He didn't do anything wrong. Look at my awesome qualifications. Your map's wrong. The weather's wrong. Everything about this is wrong. You're lucky to even have a ship. Yep. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Probably. But, I mean, somebody screwed up. Uh, yeah. So, Roberts tries a second negotiation attempt with Chochen China and fails because he gets dysentery. So he goes to Morocco where he dies. Wow. It's just as lethal on the seas as it is in Oregon Trail. Yeah. So the peacock returns to Norfolk on October 27th, 1837 with no Roberts. After this, the Peacock joins the United States Exploring Expedition in 38 and gets stuck on a bar in the Columbia River in Oregon. She breaks up July 19th in 1841 after all of her crew and much of the data that they had collected had been taken off. That is actually two of the four. What do you mean that's two of the four? That was her refit. So hold up. So to borrow from pop culture, when this was refitted and counted as a second ship after that refit, does it get an A after its designation, like everybody's favorite sci-fi ship, or how does that work? Nope. It's just the USS Peacock. She moved from a 500-ton sloop of war to a 650-ton sloop of war. And when number three comes around, it's still just the USS Peacock? Nope. No B, no C? Nope. The next USS Peacock is the USS Peacock, and she has a hull number, AM-46. Which, she has a hull number, I'm guessing this is World War II? This is one, actually. World War I. Oh. Yeah. So this is a Lapwing class minesweeper. Let's get into her vital statistics. She was laid down August 31st, 1918 and launched in April of 1919. She was sponsored by Miss A.M. Danner. She was then commissioned in December 1919. She was decommissioned in February 1920, so she did not have a long service life. I was, I was going to say, it sounds like she missed the war by that much. And then her name was stricken from the records in April of 41. Wow. That was a shining, you know, gallant series of uh, events that she took place in. 
Uh, she displaced 840 long tons or 853 tons. She was at a length of 187 feet, 10 inches. She had a beam of 35 feet, 5 inches and had a draft of 8 feet, 10 inches. She was propelled by triple expansion reciprocating steam engines powered by two Babcock and Wilcox boilers and only had one shaft. She had a speed of 14 knots or 16 miles per hour for you landlubbers. She was crewed by 85 officers and enlisted and she had two 3 inch 50 caliber guns which they look kind of like finger guns. You just described a finger gun. Yeah. The they're not very big. I'm hey, hey, I'm giving you two <laughs> three inch fifty cals right now, man. So this being a minesweeper, and I'm sure we'll get more into that as we draw to uh the conclusion of the nineteenth century and the dawn of the twentieth. I imagine it's the same idea as like a minesweeping uh tank in World War Two, just have you know, something big and heavy and probably magnetic, you know, a safe distance in front of the bow to attract and detonate mines in the path of the uh, fleet? No. No? No, these vessels would have wooden hulls and they would look for mines and disarm them or shoot them and blow them up. Oh, they're doing this the real old-fashioned way. So, after she's fitted out, she remains at her berth in New York Navy Yard until she was decommissioned. She was then loaned to the ship shipping board and converted into a salvage tug. She served under a charter to the shipping board and did various commercial activities until August 24th, 1940, when she collides with a Norwegian merchantman, the SS Hindanger, off of Cartagena, Colombia. So you could say... You could say the hen danger put the peacock in danger. Definitely. And that is her short life. That's it. Yeah. You know, I don't think we're going to be talking about peacock number three again anytime soon. So the last peacock has the whole number MSC TAC 198. This is a bluebird class minesweeper, and she was used for clearing coastal minefields. She was built by the Harbor Boat Building Company, Terminal Island in California. She was laid down January 29th of 1953. She was launched June 19th, 1954, and commissioned March of 55. Her name was stricken from the record July 1st, 1975. She displaced 362 long tons, or 368 tons. She had a length of 144 feet, 3 inches a beam of 27 feet, two inches, and she had a draft of 12 feet. She was powered by four Packard 600 horsepower diesel engines, putting out 2,400 horsepower, and she had two screws. She had a speed of 13.6 knots or 15.7 miles per hour, and had a crew complement of 40 officers and crew. She was armed with two 20 millimeter cannons and anti-aircraft mounts. So as I told you about minesweepers earlier, they had non-magnetic construction, which means wooden hull, used stainless steel, aluminum, and bronze engine and hull fittings. She was also fitted with an AN-UQS-1 Bravo sonar for mine hunting operations. That way they can get the mines that are under the water held in place by chains. Yeah. So, was she primarily for home port defense then? Just, you know, this being the height of the Cold War, paranoid that, uh, you know, them them Soviets are going to get mine set up in the Bay Area. We're going to find them and get them. No, any coastal area, it was, she would be used to hunt mines. Okay. Like in Vietnam. Oh, okay, okay. So she cost about three point five million to build, which in twenty twenty two dollars. Let me do some quick math. This is nineteen fifty three, not eighteen fifty three. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, don't worry, don't worry. I'm, I'm accounting that we're about, we're skipping ahead about a century. 
<laughs> well, folks, for a mere $38,842,265.92, you too could get your very own USS Peacock number four. So, once she's done with her training and getting fitted out, she conducts training and mice sweeping exercises along the California coast until February of 56, when she goes on her first deployment to the Far East. So while she's overseas, she participates in several joint exercises with Allied navies, participating in Operation Market Time off of Vietnam, and making port calls in the East. And she stayed over there and she continued doing deployments like that until 1970. I was going to say, it sounds like she was uh, there for pretty much the entirety of the Vietnam conflict, even when it was France. Well, what I mean is that's that was how she spent her operating life until 1970. Gotcha. And she, her home port was actually Sesbio, Japan. Makes sense. It's close. It's a U.S. naval base. Yeah, she was assigned to the U.S. 7th Fleet. So... Not that I'm sure if minesweepers are still part of the modern Navy, but was there a reason for the uh, wooden hull and then obviously, you know, metal fixtures? Like, does that provide some sort of uh, advantage for minesweeping? Being non-ferrous? Being non-magnetic. Yeah, I, I had to say that in the most pretentious way possible, didn't I? Yes. <laughs> a lot of times these mines would be magnetic, so they would be drawn to the hull of a ship to go boom. And these are the nastiest torpedoes. Yeah. So the Peacock, she takes part in general emergency operations during the Lebanon emergency in 58. And patrolled the Formosa Strait during the Taiwan crisis in 58. She regularly participated in mine exercises with the navies of Japan, Korea, China, and the Philippines. And she played an active role in market time patrol off of Vietnam throughout the war. She was the last of the minesweepers to leave Japan of her class when she headed for Long Beach, California, just after Christmas in 1970, where she was assigned as a reserve training ship. Then in 75, her name was struck from the Naval Register and she was turned to scrap in September of 76. And that's the last peacock we have. Yes. Uh, she did get three Armed Forces Expeditionary Medals. She got one Combat Action Ribbon. She got four Republic of Vietnam Notorious Unit Citations for Gallantry. She received eight Vietnam Service Medals. Hmm. That is the last boat that was named USS Peacock. So how are you feeling about your, your most favorite boat in the whole wide world? I, I think we need a fifth one. Preferably one that isn't a minesweeper. Well, then I think you need to start a petition. Get signatures so you can petition the U.S. Navy to name a USS Peacock. All right. Well, folks, if uh, you agree with me and think that that gallant and beautiful bird needs to once again grace the high seas under the United States flag, you know, why don't you uh, like our podcast? Leave a review. We'd love to hear your thoughts. You can also tweet at us at... <laughs> I know this. I know I know this. <laughs> USN History Pod. Yes. Aha! Aha! I knew it. I knew I knew it. And our email. Well, I know that one. What is it? D just stop, stop pressuring me. <laughs> <laughs> I got the Twitter handle right. <laughs> took half a year but i got it right uh yeah you, <laughs> <sighs> you can also email us at u.s navy history podcast at gmail.com and we want to wish you guys fair winds and following seas until next week guys u.s naval history podcast departing <laughs>